I remember once telling my dad that I needed to get my shit together. To which he replied, you know what you'll have when you get your shit together? A bag of shit. <laughs> I'm letting go of the idea that I'll ever actually have it together and have come to believe that one of the most valuable skills a person can have in life is in making sense of shit, or sense-making, as it's referred to in polite company. But what do I mean by sense-making? Why am I so enamored with it? And how does one do it? The term has been around for about 50 years, but there's still debate about the exact definition. But to put it simply, sense-making is what we do when something doesn't make sense to us. We do it all the time, we're just not usually very deliberate about it. To sense-make on purpose, you have to leave the known zone. But there was a point in my life when I disliked uncertainty so much that I was good at not seeing things I didn't want to see. Case in point, Christmas Eve 1999, I found out that my then husband was addicted to heroin. I wasn't completely oblivious to the clue that's, clues that something was amiss, but it's hard to understand how certainty could have been so essential to my sense of safety that I couldn't be uncertain long enough to figure out what was going on. Daniel Kahneman won a Nobel Prize for his work that sheds a little light on this. Evolution has gifted us with very fast but flawed shortcuts for sussing things out. And one of those shortcuts makes the certainty of knowing feel a hell of a lot safer than not knowing. Some of the certainty that I was clinging to was that I was sensible, I was logical, and that is how you made good decisions. Hell, I had a good life to prove it. I was a software engineer, making a good living. I had a huge house in a beautiful neighborhood with my real estate developer husband. But this bomb of heroin addiction had me fundamentally questioning how I navigated life. I needed not just to tolerate unknowing, I had to invite it in to stay a while. A reboot was kicked off without a doubt, but I hadn't pressed Control-Alt-Delete the plug had been pulled from the wall. For years after this, I was in a kind of a holding pattern. I did a lot of yoga, and I read books on philosophy and psychology and neuroscience, and I eventually quit my job. I was having uh, breakfast with some friends one morning, and I was going on about some brain science theory or other, when one of my friends asked me, have you considered going to grad school? I bet you'd find people there who actually like hearing about this stuff. <laughs> it took me a while to find a place where I could study the kind of plug-pulling reboot that I had experienced. I eventually landed in the Human Development and Psychology program at Harvard. And after finishing my master's degree there, I stayed on at the Learning Innovations Lab called Lila. Lila was a hotbed of sense-making where I was able to assemble a sort of Swiss army knife of sense-making tools and frameworks. But what did my sense-making look like before my Swiss army knife and way before the plug was pulled? The first time I pressed Control-Alt-Delete, I was a freshman at Towson State, as it was called back then. I spent my very first semester of college abroad in Italy with a group of other art students. It was wonderful, of course. It was Italy. But it did raise doubts in me about my skills as an artist and whether I could make a living at it. I had not consider considered anything but art, at least not since the fourth grade, when apparently I told my mom that I wanted to be a newscaster. <laughs> I fished around for something more practical, landing on architecture. I had a lot of catching up to do, but when I was ready for calculus, I could transfer to the University of Maryland as a 
pre-engineering student since the prerequisites were the same as for architecture. I woke up in my junior year having forgotten that I was even aiming for architecture. By this point, I was a mechanical engineering major. Not long after, an engineer where I was interning told me I had to get out of mechanical engineering, that it was a dead-end major, no jobs. This was just some random guy, but it shook me. And so once again, I pressed Control, Alt, Delete, and I changed my major to electrical engineering, and I got a new internship in computer systems development, despite knowing next to nothing about computers or programming. Decades later at Lila, my role was to make animated videos, despite not knowing how to do that either. My point is, I couldn't have charted this path if I tried. Poet Antonio Machado put this beautifully. Wanderer, your footprints are the path, nothing else. Wanderer, there is no road. You make a path in walking. My freshman self could think of only three things she could do with an art degree. Artist, art teacher, or graphic designer. She didn't think she was good enough for the first, and she assumed she wouldn't like the other two. She was sense-making to the best of her abilities, but I think it's pretty obvious that there might have been possibilities that she was missing. And this is why I love sense-making, because it allows me to stick with those not-so-safe feelings of uncertainty so that I can more clearly see what is and what could be. If I could hand my Swiss Army knife to my freshman self, I am not sure that it would help her stick with her not-so-safe feelings of uncertainty. But what might have helped her was having someone to sense-make on purpose with, a thought partner, if you will. I picked up the term thought partner in grad school, and I use it all the time, but this is the first time I've really tried to pin down what thought partnering has come to mean to me. First off, a thought partner does not just commiserate with you, saying things like, yeah, that professor does sound like a real jerk, although sometimes that's nice to hear. They also don't offer opinions or adv advice unless you ask for it or at least consent to it. When that guy told me to change my major, that was an example of the kind of spontaneous sense-making that goes on all the time. There's nothing wrong with it, it's just not what I mean by thought partnering. A thought partner is someone to wi who's willing to not know with you. They will listen deeply while you think out loud in whatever way it comes out. And they'll really try and understand, asking genuine questions, not give advice disguised as questions, asking things like, have you considered X? When what they really mean is, I think you should do X. They'll also help you to tease apart and label what in normal conversation comes out all mashed together. And on occasion, they will gently invite you to ask yourself, is that true? Tell me more about what makes you say you're not good enough to be an artist. When I started this talk, I said that sense-making is what we do when something doesn't make sense to us. But there's a real paradox here, because to sense-make on purpose, you have to choose to leave the known zone, at times even when you're really certain about where you are and where you're going. I'm not suggesting that this is easy. Those cognitive shortcuts that make it feel unsafe or at least uncomfortable to do this, they have been honed for millennia. Add to that the social pressure to know things, especially at a university. But while you're assembling your Swiss Army knife, Thought partnering is one way you could play around with making sense of something right away. You might already know some thought partners, and you can even be one for yourself. But if you can't find one, at least now you have a few ideas about how you could be one.
Thank you so much. <laughs>